So, uh, my name is Daniel Becker, and together with my colleague Chabo Rikofa, we'll be talking about uh, reading Apache Parquet files in uh, Impala. So first, we'll have an introductory round uh, about what Impala and Parquet are. Then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the Parquet file format and some of its features. Afterwards, Chaba will talk about uh, Impala's own Parquet scanner and how you can use Parquet better in Apache Impala. So first, what is Apache Impala? It is a distributed massively parallel SQL database engine whose main feature is speed. Uh, it contains two, it consists of two main parts. One of this, them is the front end, which uh, takes care of query planning and optimization. And this part is written in Java. The other part, the back end, uh, is uh, the part that takes care of uh, query execution. And for performance reasons, it is written in C++. And sometimes we also use some runtime code generation to make it even faster. Impala supports various uh, storage systems, uh, including HDFS, S3 in the cloud, but also database uh, storage engines like Kudu or HBase. In terms of table formats, we used to rely on Hive's table format, but uh, these days we focus more and more on Apache Iceberg. Then Parquet is the most important uh, file format that Impala supports, but uh, we also have uh, ORC, text, and various other file formats. Now, what is Apache Parquet? It is a compressed and efficient column-oriented uh, data file format, uh, and it supports various encodings and compressions and uh, different features that we'll talk about a, a bit later. And um, there are many, many tools with which you can write or read Parquet files. Uh, the reference implementation is Parquet MR. Uh, this is a Java library, but there are others, uh, such as Parquet CPP, etc. But in Impala, we use neither. Uh, we use our own scanner and uh, writer because uh, we want to optimize reading and writing Parquet to our own specific needs. Naturally, different uh, readers and writers may have uh, wildly different characteristics, uh, for example, in terms of CPU or mem memory usage, uh, I.O. utilization and a set of supported features or default uh, settings. Now, let's talk very briefly about the Parquet file format. Uh, in the Parquet file, uh, you have uh, a schema, uh, a set of rows, and you divide these rows into row groups. And then within each row group, you store uh, the values in a column oriented way. Then uh, a column chunk is the part of a column that is within a single row group. Um, a column chunk may still uh, may, may further be subdivided into different pages, each of which uh, may have its own encoding. Now let's look at some key features. Uh, I've already mentioned encodings. Uh, of course, uh, the goal of encodings is to represent values on disk, usually in a space-efficient manner, and some encodings also make it possible to, to process the data more efficiently. In Parquet, encoding is done at the page level. Uh, here, I've listed all the encodings that are currently supported by Parquet. Impala supports a subset of it, uh, but now I will talk about uh, dictionary encoding and delta encoding. So first, let's see dictionary encoding. With this, we store all the distinct values that occur in a column chunk, make a dictionary of it, and in subsequent data pages, we only store the indices into this dictionary. This is very useful and space efficient if you have a small number of distinct values. Otherwise, you may want to use different uh, encodings. Um, here you can see in this image how it works. So we construct a dictionary on the fly and we uh, only store indices with a, a bit packed run, and run length encoding. Uh, the next uh, is delta encoding, uh, for which I actually implemented a reader and writer a couple of years ago. This encoding is um, uh, applicable for integers. So let's say we have a list of integers, and instead of storing all the values as they are, and they may be huge, 
we store the differences between consecutive values and bit pack these differences. If uh, the differences between the values are small, then we can use a lot fewer bits. So uh, we use much less space on disk. Uh, the first value, of course, has to be uh, stored normally. But afterwards, uh, in parquet delta encoding, we only use deltas. Uh, these deltas are then further divided into blocks and mini blocks. And in each block, uh, the deltas are offset by the most negative value. Uh, this ensures that we don't have to deal with negative values. After that, uh, each mini block may have its own uh, bit width for bit packing. So this is a way to adapt to the nature of your data. Uh, we found some drawbacks uh, connected to delta encoding. The first is uh, it could actually be thought of as a, an advantage. Uh, this is the configurability of block and mini block sizes. Uh, because uh, the, these can be configured, we can't really use an optimized algorithm for just uh, a couple of fixed values, but we have to be general. The other, maybe more serious problem, is uh, data dependency. So each value depends on all of the values that come before it. So we can't, for example, say we are not interested in the next 50 values. We'd like to skip them. And it's not really possible to parallelize writing or reading these. If we had some uh, absolute values uh, in between the deltas, uh, for example, uh, every hundredth value would be a non-delta value, then these things would become possible. So in conclusion, we think that uh, using delta encoding as a default encoding for all integers is probably not a good idea, but for some specific but very usual use cases, it is really good. Uh, these include auto-incrementing columns or timestamps in a time series. Uh, I've mentioned previously that uh, compression is also supported by Parquet, and it, is, it comes after encoding. Naturally, the goal is to reduce uh, the data size on disk. Um, Parquet supports different algorithms, and so you can trade off uh, space uh, against uh, computational cost. Now, what is even more interesting are the filtering techniques. Uh, the first one is called column indexing in Parquet. This means that we can have max and min values for each page uh, in, um, in Parquet, or also at the column chunk level. And if we are only interested in some values or a range of values, then um, we can skip pages that um, do not match this range. For example, uh, we have this example query here where we'd only like to get rows where the ID is at least five. If we encounter a page where the value is less, uh, where all the values are less than five, we don't have to read uh, that page. We can just skip it. The next filtering technique is dictionary filtering, which can be used uh, if the column chunk is dictionary encoded. Uh, so again, if we are only interested in some specific values and the dictionary does not contain these values, then we can uh, discard the whole column chunk. The third one is Bloom filtering. It is not connected to any specific encoding. It is uh, an additional metadata that can be added to Parquet files uh, at, at the column chunk level. So uh, Bloom filter is a probabilistic data structure where if you insert a value and check it later, uh, the filter will always return true. Uh, but if you want to retrieve a value that was not inserted, the check uh, will probably result uh, in a false response, but it is allowed to return true. Uh, Bloom filters can be used much like dictionary filters, but uh, they work with uh, much higher NDVs at the cost of being less precise. But we're always on the safe side, so it's not possible to discard information that we actually need. So for example, taking this same uh, example query here, if the Bloom filter returns that uh, 125 is not in the filter, then we can be sure that the page does not actually contain it. And uh, the rest of the, the presentation will be given by Chaba. Hi. So we will be looking a bit deeper inside uh, the, the Parker scanner of Impala. So 
look below the hood to see what exactly happens. It will be the same concepts as the one ones uh, described by Daniel, but uh, more like uh, how we, we actually do them. So what, is the what are the responsibilities of the parquet scanner? So we read the rows and uh, apply the predicates. We apply every predicate in the scanner level, so not just single column, one, but every predicate. And uh, one kind of special thing from, for Impala is that we want, uh, don't want to fit the whole row group to the memory. We try to come up with memory constraints to have as li to use as little memory during scanning as possible. Also, the whole result that, uh, does not have to fit into memory. Even a small parquet file can blow up to a lot of data be uh, because of the efficient encodings. Mm. Here's the basic uh, design of the implementation. So one uh, row group is uh, processed only by a single thread. The I.O. is an exception that uh, happens in parallel, so the uh, I.O. reads and the actual processing can overlap. The I.O. system uh, supports a lot of things. And uh, at the end, uh, we move this to a row-oriented format and apply the predicates, and the predicates are compiled with LLVM, so it's quite efficient. Yeah, and one thing back to threading. Uh, scanners are handled in a special way, so Impala can uh, handle threading in two ways. In one case, we set the exact number of uh, threads used by an execution unit called fragment instance that will tell us how many threads to use. And uh, there is another more legacy, but in some ways a more sophisticated solution where the scanners can decide uh, adaptively how many threads to use. So it starts with one, but if there is enough memory and not many scanners are used in parallel, then we start new scanner threads. Yeah, so we try to estimate the, the memory requirements. Mainly, uh, we have some I.O. buffer requirements. We try to read every column in separate streams and uh, do some uh, read ahead. Uh, this depending on the, so it can work with pretty small amount of memory, but uh, sometimes we increase the memory to make it more uh, faster. And uh, after uh, we read the pages, we have to decompress them somewhere, and for that we have to keep in memory one data page for every column, and if it's dictionary encoding, then also the dictionary page, and from this the dictionary page can be pretty large. The results are, yeah, we have uh, batches of limited number of rows that can also take some memory. Yeah, and uh, we are trying to estimate this uh, during planning, but it's not easy. So we use a number of distinct values to estimate the sizes of the dictionary, but reality may be very different. And when we are starting new scanner threads, we try, based on the previous threads, uh, actual memory needs, we try to guess whether we are free to launch another uh, thread. And if uh, uh, we run out of memory, uh, Impala doesn't crash, we have a tracked memory allocation at every bigger allocation, so we check whether we have enough memory, and if no, then we just stop the, uh, the query. So practically every query has some limits. Uh, it cannot expand uh, more than that. And generally, the scanners doesn't use that much memory, but there are some extreme cases, like white tables with uh, hundreds or thousands of uh, columns, and also a lot of, lot of scanners can run in parallel. Mm. Uh, so lazy materialization is, I think, kind of specific to Impala. This is... Uh, relatively simple. First, we read the, those columns that are actually have predicates on them, try to evaluate them, and if we are lucky and uh, a lot of, uh, lot of these predicates fail, then the, we can skip larger blocks uh, for the other columns. This can even mean uh, skipping pages completely. And this is like a quick uh, stepwise 
description about what happens. So this is a parquet file with a single row group. Uh, what you see in the, uh, the picture is uh, more or less how it's laid out inside the file. So first we read the file metadata. It's a one big strip structure at the footer of the file. And this can be problematic that it's a, a single structure because if it grows very large, we cannot uh, deserialize only the parts of it that are interesting to us. We have to deserialize the whole thing. And this contains the, the min max values for columns uh, at a row group level, so we can uh, apply min max filtering at this point and uh, drop the whole row group if uh, it doesn't match. And after uh, that, we uh, look at column uh, filtering. That's kind of page filtering is a better name for it. So the column and offset indexes uh, contain these bin max statistics on a per page level and also contain the offsets of uh, every page. So this allows us to read the, the relevant predicate uh, column statistics, see if we can skip some regions of the, the data. And based on the offset indexes, we can already decide uh, what we can skip also IO-wise. And I, as, far, as far as I know, this is also a specific uh, optimization to Impala that, uh, like ParkML, uh, in this case, doesn't skip the IO, only the decompression. And uh, yeah, those, those crossed out pages are the, the ones that we do, could uh, skip based on column indexes. And uh, there's a sad remark about the pages being not aligned. So this makes this, uh, this is actually a fairly complex logic behind it uh, to know exactly what we can uh, uh, skip and we later may have to skip uh, pages partially. Yeah, and uh, after that we read the Bloom filters for the column where Bloom filtering is possible. Mm, yeah, we can skip the row groups if it doesn't match. And after that comes the dictionary filtering. We, we read first the dictionary page for the, the predicate columns and uh, check the predicates for uh, each uh, uh, value in the dictionary to know whether it is possible to satisfy the predicate. If none satisfies the predicate, well, then we skip the whole row group. Uh, and then comes this kind of the lazy, lazy materialization logic. We go forward with the predicate uh, columns and catch up with the non-predicate columns. Uh, one thing to mention here, then, that's kind of, uh, there's a compromise in all these optimizations because we want to read as little as possible. For example, if there is a Bloom filter, we want to check it first. Maybe if based on the uh, Bloom filter, we don't have to read anything. But at the same time, it would also make sense to start reading in parallel because if the Bloom filter actually doesn't skip the row group, then we lost time. So this is a bit complex in this case whether we save I.O. with uh, lazy materialization because uh, if we would uh, strictly uh, skip I.O. So, uh, so, um, so if we would uh, optimize really on uh, skipping I.O., then we wouldn't be able to read forward uh, as much as we want to do with an I.O. and maybe blocked on I.O. Yeah, and that's a final part. It's some tips on how to get the most out of the parquet files. It's, uh, it's not very specific to Impala. It's uh, some things to think through uh, when you create a parquet table. So by default, uh, uh, park is an okay file format, but it doesn't really have indexing. So it's, if you know your queries, you may, you may be able to do this better. And currently, it's, it, the, the SQL engines doesn't uh, help too much with it. So actually, you have to know your data, know what kind of predicates are run, know the capabilities of the writer, because practically every writer library uses different uh, um, arg arguments to set these uh, different uh, options. And also, we have to know the capabilities of the reader. So like, if you write your table with Spark and read it with Impala, 
um, it's good to have a big picture of what these engines actually know. Also, blue filter sizing is a different matter. And I encourage, I encourage people to actually try rewriting part of their data several times and check how efficient it is and not just rely on uh, query times because those can be very misleading in a complex system, but instead uh, check the actual IO bytes read, the user system, system time on CPU. Mm. Yeah, like typically if, if a query is IO heavy, then you won't see the CPU time in the, the query time, but if there is actually a busy cluster with a lot of threads running, then you will see the CPU time. Yeah, uh, one idea is to play with the compression. The default uh, compression is snappy in Impala and as far as I know all uh, Parquet libraries, but it's often not the best uh, solution. Uh, probably the fastest to decode and then code, but uh, uh, also has worse compression. Generally, there are two families of encodings, the ones that are byte-oriented and they are generally faster, like Snappy and lz 4 and uh, generally they are perfect for encoding strings, but for encoding uh, doubles and integers, they are not that good. And uh, if most of your data is on those types, then uh, gzip.z standard can help. <clears throat> Yeah, so generally we don't have indexes in Hive tables or Iceberg tables, but if you actually sort uh, when you insert your data into Parquet, you will practically have a, an index. Uh, so like if you have column one and column two, and these are the ones used in predicates, you can sort by it and it will act as a, an index. And sorting also helps in a, um, encodings and compression, so generally these uh, columns will be encoded much better. Mm. Yeah, it's, there are some tricks when uh, considering uh, how to, exactly what to sort by and in what order, and one has to think through the number of distinct values of different uh, columns and uh, relations between the columns. Mm. Yeah, uh, so row group and, uh, and page sizes are different uh, in different uh, writers, so they have different defaults and different ways to configure it. Uh, Impala is very simple in that case, and every file has only a single uh, row group. And the benefits of a large row group is that you don't have to duplicate your dictionaries, mainly and smaller row group will better, more fine-grained uh, filtering for dictionary filtering, bool filtering, and others. And one thing is important, that don't create very, very small row groups, because uh, all row groups, uh, MIMAX statistics, are in a single thrift uh, structure, and you have to process the whole thing at the beginning of uh, processing a parquet file. Uh, page sizes are less, sensi less sensitive, so they can be pretty large. You can bring that down to 100 or whatever you want to. Uh, generally, if it's smaller, then the compression won't be as efficient. That's the main problem. But it also allows you much more fine-grained min-max filtering. And uh, there is a uh, warning about some bad defaults. So, for example, Impala by default uh, uh, don't have a max row count for a page, only a max uh, size, encoded size. And this can be a problem because uh, if you sort by a column to so use it as an index, then it will be compre compre uh, encoded and compressed very efficiently, and it may turn out that it becomes a, sing a single page, maybe enough to uh, store all the data for the file, and that uh, practically kills min-max filtering. Uh, Another thing is that like, different readers can push down different predicates. This is something that is both after the planner and uh, the scanner library. Mm. So there are some easy cases when you have a predicate on a single column, but the, some of these uh, examples below could be uh, checked based on uh, bloom filtering and other uh, filtering techniques, but uh, not all uh, engines may be able to do it, including Impala. And one final slide. 
it's about uh, bloom filters that uh, yeah then uh, so then to use bloom filtering is a bit tricky it's kind of a, a secondary index so practically if uh, there are too many distinct values to use a dictionary then enabling bloom filtering can be useful but uh, you have to know your data for this. So like know, knowing the number of distinct values is not enough. Uh, in this example, we know that uh, it will work on. Yeah, and one more thing to bloom filtering is that, uh, so in Impala you can set it, uh, you can enable it with some table properties, but it, it, it depends on the, the engine. So Hyped uses different properties. And thanks for the attention.